Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today on the channel, it's minus 45 with the wind chill, minus 37 resting temperature. And we're gonna talk today about surviving in cold weather, a very serious topic. We are in the midst of a very serious cold snap up here in the north. The only way I can actually film this video is if the cameras are inside my truck right now being constantly warm because cameras and most electronic devices won't function for about five minutes in these kind of temperatures. The majority of people are going to die of exposure up here if the hits the fan and the natural gas stops flowing. That's, that's just all there is to it. So let's talk about surviving cold weather. One of the first things that people are gonna die from is exposure. It's not gonna take long for your body temperature to drop below optimal amounts out here. And you're probably gonna notice throughout the course of this video, in spite of the fact that I'm in my level three survival gear right now, my speech is gonna start to slur because honestly, it gets so cold that even just moving your mouth out here talking can become <laughs> very laborious. With the exception of the last few years, there was a study done by The Lancet in 2015 that showed that you are 20 times more likely to die of cold weather than you are of hot weather. There is the one benefit of being in a cold environment is that if you are properly prepared and you have the proper gear, you can always warm yourself up. It's not always as easy to cool yourself down in a hot environment. Now, one thing you need to realize is that the body, as intelligent as nature is, the body's also kind of dumb because it hasn't caught up with the fact that our mental faculties have evolved rapidly over the last 10,000 years. As a result of that, the body's main objective in a cold situation like this is to keep the core warm. That's its main mission. And that's gonna come at the cost of restricting blood flow to your extremities. And that's gonna mean that you're not gonna be able to do the finer tasks, which might actually help you get warm in a survival situation. The body still thinks it's 20,000 years ago and the best way to ride something like this out is going to be to hibernate and to basically take all blood away from the extremities. The core vital organs, the heart and all of that hasn't caught up with our more nascent features like the neocortex, cerebral cortex, which is what's going to allow us to uh, have those finer motor movements that we might start a fire with a bow drill, go and harvest some firewood, stuff that we're gonna have to do to keep warm, build a shelter. The body essentially is quite dumb when it comes to uh, self-preservation in the cold. Now, as you can see, I look like a 80s rock band, dejected member of KISS or something like that, one of those hair bands. Nobody said that this prepping thing was gonna get you dates and fashionable accolades. This prepping thing is about function, over fashion. When the shit hits the fan, you're gonna be the envy of most people and that's probably not gonna be a good thing when the whole cannibalism thing takes off. So what I'm wearing here is a lot of animal fibers. And I know a lot of people, they misconstrue the wearing of fur for preparedness and for survival with the whole fashionable fur, fur is murder stuff of the 70s, 60s and, and beyond that, okay? The old fur trade, a lot of it was about fashion for a while. Before that, however, it was about survival because that's the only way you can survive out here. Nature's materials are far more robust and more intelligent than mankind's creations will ever be for a long, long time. There is no synthetic garment known to man that is going to keep you alive out here in a way that is going to allow you to still maintain some dexterity with what you're doing. You can wrap yourself in insulation, but you're not gonna be able to do a whole lot. That's why nature took millions of years, billions of years in some cases, to create fur for mammals so that they can navigate environments like this. So as you're seeing here, I'm wearing a lot of fur garments, but the thing about these fur garments is that these are gonna last me a lifetime. Whereas the 20, 30, 40 pairs of mitts and gloves and socks and uh, different types of pants and jackets that you're gonna wear throughout the years are gonna lead to a much higher carbon footprint. So just keep that in mind before you go down there in the comment section and start throwing shade. The carbon footprint of this is significantly less. So starting at the top, I have a leather trapper's hat that has a coyote fur trim lining. 
very generous amount. We also have one of the warmest jackets out there. This is the Outdoor Survival Canada ATCA jacket. It's not as warm as their Mission jacket, which is rated to minus 60. This is rated to minus 50 just by itself. That's not counting what you're wearing underneath it in terms of layers. I have my Coyote fur mitts with buffalo hide on the palms. And then they also have a sheepskin liner in here. And then I'm actually wearing the ATCA overalls underneath a jacket which add a significant amount of heat to your core because the overalls actually come up to about here. So <laughs> the difference between wearing the overalls and just the jacket is literally night and day. It's very, very warm. In fact, I would not recommend wearing the overalls unless it's below minus 20 for an extended period of time. Right now, at these temperatures, it's perfectly suited. For boots, I have the Baffin Iger boots. These are actually rated to minus 100, believe it or not. And I have a sheepskin liner in there. Now, in spite of that, that all sounds good, but realistically, you can take that number and you can easily have it to get the real amount. It's kind of like those radios who boast 60 mile range and really they're only five mile range. That's basically what you're getting with a boot. And of course, it's only as good as the circulation to your feet. So you're gonna see some thermal images here of feet and hands, and it's gonna show you how little heat actually goes to your extremities, to your toes and your fingers. So it's very important that you, you try to find a way to keep those warm. Now, so long as your core is warm, then your body is gonna keep regulating blood flow to those regions. It's not gonna vasoconstrict and try to restrict blood flow to the extremities if that core can be warm. So that's why it's so important to keep your jacket and keep your torso area as warm as possible. I'm gonna post a link in the description to an extensive study which was done on caloric expenditure in colder temperatures. It's a meta-analysis of studies that were done with soldiers and their caloric needs when in cold environments. And drum roll please, Captain Obvious here, it takes a lot more calories to survive in a climate like this up to 7,000 calories a day. And I would venture to say in a true survival situation, it could even be up to 10,000 calories a day because it takes your body a lot of energy in order to keep warm. This is something that you absolutely don't want to underestimate how many calories you need in order to survive out here. That's why an hour invested in collecting firewood, it might seem like a, a big investment of energy, but that's gonna provide you that six hours of warmth so that you don't have to expend twice the amount of calories throughout that six hours. So you have to look at it that way. There is an inverse relationship with the temperature drop and the amount of calories that you need. What they found is on average, in minus 20 conditions, a soldier would need between 4,000 to 5,000 calories a day just to sustain their body weight. And of course, soldiers have barracks. They're not outside all the time. So when you're in a true survival situation and it's minus 35 like this, you are expending a lot of energy. I did an overnight survival challenge where I had no shelter once and it was uh, minus 35 and I was just sitting there eating freeze dried food around a fire all night and it, I could not get full because I was burning the energy right as it was coming into my body. So this is something to keep in mind. Now in terms of susceptibility to the cold, uh, genetics are probably going to play a bit of a role. The amount of brown fat you have plays a role. I'm not going to get into the, all the intricacies of that. The amount of fat that you have on your body to insulate your vital organs is also going to play a role. By and large, you keep your core warm, you dress properly, you make sure you're sheltered, you make sure that you're out of the wind. Remember how heat is lost, convection, conduction, evaporation, and radiation. Conduction is basically the movement of warm to a colder medium by a touch. Convection is the wind chill factor or having the warmth essentially blown off you. Radiation is just the tendency of warm to diffuse into a colder medium. And of course, evaporation is through sweat. So hypothermia is actually a lot more common in moderately cold temperatures. For starters, most people aren't stupid enough to go out in this kind of weather. They're smart enough to stay inside. But what happens often is that a lot of people underestimate those more milder, colder temperatures, mild to moderate cold. So we're talking zero to minus 15 degrees. 
people underestimate that, especially when you start to sweat or if you get wet, your body is going to lose heat 25 times faster when it's in water than when it's in air. So if you are drenched or you're in a wet t-shirt or something like that, you have to find a way to get dry as fast as possible. The optimal body temperature is gonna be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, around 37 degrees Celsius. Any deviation from that is going to start to cause problems. When your temperature starts to drop in the low 90s, you're going to start to become very lightheaded. You're going to have slurred speech. You're not going to be able to have the coordination required to do things. You're going to start making bad decisions. Then you're going to start shivering in an attempt to keep the body warm. And shivering is the body's natural way of trying to create movement uh, in, on a fine micro level in order to create thermogenesis, which is basically a, a biological organism's ability to generate its own heat, basically converting caloric energy into heat energy. So shivering is like doing exercise on a micro level. So this is a body's natural reaction to prevent hypothermia. And that's, that's when you know you're in the first stages of hypothermia. Now, most people seldom dip beyond that mild level of hypothermia. You go inside, you get warm, and that's it. Now, if your body temperature continues to drop into the 80s, that's when you are potentially at the risk of losing consciousness. And if it continues to drop after that, that's when you run the risk of going into uh, cardiac arrest. One of the side effects of severe hypothermia is actually a burning sensation and it has something to do with vasodilation and I don't know all the specifics of it, but it's called paradoxical undressing. And your brain actually thinks that you're burning up even though you're freezing to death. And a German study found that in 25% of cases of severe hypothermia, people were actually found with their clothes off. So they undressed before they died because their brain was tricked into thinking that it was very cold. Another thing you don't see me wearing right now are goggles or some eye protection. Your corneas absolutely can freeze, especially if you're on a snowmobile or you're traveling and you're going into a headwind. It's absolutely imperative that you have some sort of eye protection. Uh, snow blindness is another factor. This is why you'll see a lot of people up in the far north, the Inuit, they'll have those glasses with slits in the optics and that's just to restrict the amount of light that is coming in because there's so much light because of all the snow that it reflects all that light onto the eyes and of course it's overwhelming, it can be quite blinding. There's essentially two types of way that your body is going to freeze. There's this thing called frost nip is just the freezing of your skin and it's something which is much more mild. Frostbite is more subcuteness in nature, so that's going to be the freezing of the actual muscles, the fat, the ligaments, the bone, essentially, and uh, which of course is going to have potential long-term consequences, possibly even amputation. So all the more reason to make sure that you keep your extremities as warm as possible. And I'm telling you right now that the only reason why my hands are warm and the only reason why I'm able to make this video right now is that I have a goose down jacket from Survival Canada with 650 goose down fill. I have my coyote fur trim mitts. I have my bath and boots with my sheep uh, lining inside. And of course my trapper's hat with the coyote lining. That is absolutely the only way I'm able to do this right now. So you need to be prepared. The majority of people are going to die of exposure up here if the shit hits the fan and the natural gas stops flowing. That's, that's just all there is to it. And there's not gonna be many workarounds. Even if you plan on bunkering in and bugging in and insulating a room in your home, eventually you're gonna to have to go out, whether that's to stand in a bread line or to chop wood, you're gonna to have to go out into the world and do stuff and you're going to need the gear and stuff like this. This jacket I've had for over four years. I know that this jacket is going to be with me for at least another 10 years. I know these mitts, I'm going to have them for a lifetime. The boots, um, all that stuff is going to last for a long, long time. So this is one of, in my opinion, one of the best investments you can make for winter preparedness is your wardrobe. And it really is a wardrobe 
in the truest sense of the word when we're talking about doing battle with the elements. So it's absolutely imperative, guys, that you have a contingency plan for winter, that you get out there, you try to acclimate yourself, you get yourself accustomed to working in these types of conditions. Even if you don't live in a place that tends to get that cold, it's very important that you've had some exposure and some training in this type of environment, some familiarity with it. So if it does hit you, it's not going to be a huge shocker. Another thing to keep in mind is that in winter, you're gonna be expending a lot more energy, not just by virtue of thermogenesis and trying to keep your body warm, but whether that's commuting, especially by foot, walking through snow is far more laborious, especially if you don't have snowshoes, than is gonna be traveling in the summertime. So you gotta factor all these things in. The only saving grace with winter time, and there's, there's a few benefits to winter survival that I've talked about in videos that you can go and see here. Uh, one of the things that is great in winter time is that you can use a sled to tow your gear. And it's actually a very uh, energy efficient way of towing gear. You can make a sled very simply. We'll show you how to do that in a future video. Or you can, of course, just go and get yourself a sled from a local hardware store while you have the chance. So I would strongly advise you to not underestimate the cold. It is absolutely imperative that you have a plan of action for these types of conditions. Let me know how you plan on enduring a winter power outage where you live. And if you live in Florida, well, I guess you're sitting pretty until the waters start to rise. Thanks for watching guys. Stay safe out there and stay warm. Happy New Year, Canadian Prepper out.